You ever heard of a nose fluke? No. You put it on your nose and you blow and then you move your lips in. You know, you move. And you can make, make different notes with your mouth in different positions because of a nose fluke. <laughs> Man, I got you there. <laughs> What's that, honey? I'm coming. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Bearded Bible Brothers. I am your bearded host, Matt Crosswhite. And trying to pull himself together from a, a, a laughing fit is Josiah Marshall. <laughs> oh, that's so hard out. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> oh, the best part is our audience has no idea why you're laughing. No, not a clue. <laughs> No, but you know this is what I love about this episode, the, 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 this podcast is that we we have these fun moments, and in, especially in the middle of either in the middle of or after some pretty serious stuff, we go. There's still reason to have fun, to laugh, and to just have a blast. Yep. <laughs> right. Plus, I just love making you laugh right before we start recording. <laughs> it's honestly, it's a goal of mine every single Monday when we sit down to record. I noticed. I want to get <laughs> Josiah guffawing right before we start. Yeah, and then uh, I got to yeah. Okay, I can do this. <laughs> they say laughter is the best medicine, so really you should be paying me for it. I can do this. I feel good. I feel great. I feel wonderful. I feel good. I feel great. I feel wonderful. <laughs> hey, I can do this. <laughs> well, folks, today we have another fun episode um today we are talking about our favorite tv shows we realize mm -hmm. we've done we've done music we've done movies we've done books uh, up to and including audiobooks but we haven't done tv shows so today we're going to discuss our favorite tv shows do you want to mm -hmm. start it shall i you start it okay so it turns out that I had very, very poor taste in entertainment before I met my wife. And she quickly remedied that for me. So, Your so wife now, educated my, you? She sure did. And, <laughs> and my tastes changed. And I became civilized. And so one of my favorite TV shows is Doctor Who. Now, if if you're an American mm. and you've never heard of Doctor Who, it's because it's a British TV show. And it ran from the mid-1950s up through, I think, late 70s, early 80s. And then it stopped. And uh, all of that running, I have not seen. I, I think I saw the original episode, but... In, uh, in the early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s, um, they brought it back. And mm -hmm. so I've watched, I'm, I'm not all caught up. They've, they've uh, taken the show a couple of different directions that I wasn't sure that I was excited about. So I stopped for a while. Um, but it is a fun, fun show. And so, yeah. What do you like about it? Um. British humor definitely takes some getting used to, but once you... It's only a flesh wound. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yes. The holy hand grenade of Antioch. Yes. Um, so... <laughs> that was a good one. Body fight on anybody? Um, was it... Uh, uh, there's a line out your of black. Your father was a hamster, and your father it. smelled of elderberries. <laughs> yes, and then of course his black adder. But go ahead. Yes. So, uh, as we've just demonstrated, uh, <laughs> British humor takes some some getting used to. But um, Doctor Who is a sci-fi show. It's fun and quirky, and the basic premise of the show is that. 
um there's this alien guy who looks like a normal human being but he's a time lord and he travels through space and time basically protecting humanity from everything and and other alien species as well and um but it's it's fun and it's creative the sense of humor that they give him and it the the actors turn over every few seasons uh, kind of like think about 007 mm. how the title 007 has existed but there's been different people who have been 007 mm -hmm. in similar way doctor who the 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 plot continues but it's not just a title that someone carries like in 007 it's more that um the when when that when the doctor the, the the gentleman the alien guy his name is the doctor um when he's got a mortal wound or he's about to die or something instead of dying and being replaced by someone else who takes on the title mm -hmm. he doesn't actually die he just quote unquote regenerates and when okay. he does it, he looks completely different. His face is different. His voice is different. His mannerisms are different. But he has all of his old memories. He mm. he is the same person. He just looks like a completely different and acts like a completely different person, which is fun because as the doctors turn over, the show continues to stay alive, but with a a new lead leading actor who does a beautiful job of it and puts their own spin on it and their own creative mm -hmm. it, it's a lot of fun we really enjoy it especially um I, I need to look up the actor's name hang on one second but um the matt actor who is responsible Mabali. okay so matt smith is doctor um four, 11. isn't it oh 11. oh oh, oh, oh. Uh, he's he's number three of the new series no, of the okay. Okay. okay but they just continue the numbering system so when the show started up again, um, they started with Doctor Number Nine mm. um, because apparently the one who who finished the series in the seventies or eighties was um, was Number Eight. But okay. um, uh, Christopher, uh, oh dear, I'm going to butcher this, <laughs> Eccleston. Okay, Christopher Eccleston. He often plays a British villain. He was the villain in the GI Joe movie. Um, but anyway, he grew up loving Doctor Who, mm -hmm. and so becoming an actor, he went to BBC at one point and said, "Hey, I grew up loving this. Can we bring it back?" And mm. they said, "Yes, but only if you play the Doctor." And oh, he wow. said okay, I'll do it, but I can only commit to one season because I'm already scheduled to do, I think it was G.I. Joe that he okay. was already committed to. Okay. Um, so he does it. They bring the show back. So so his full-length season of Doctor Who is a little bit lower budget, Okay. but it's still really fantastic. Mm. And, then, um, and then after him comes in David Tennant to be Doctor Number 10. Mm. And then he was he was on for three or four seasons, and then Matt Smith was on for three or four, and then Peter Capaldi, and then they brought a woman in. I don't remember that. That's kind of where I stopped temporarily. I never finished Peter Capaldi. I'm going back through and watching them now, but but it's a fun show. It's quirky. It's um, in number ten with Doctor Number Ten, uh, uh -huh. David Tennant. I swear, some of the the writers had to have been strong christians because oh really in, in, in the latter <laughs> two seasons the, his last two seasons as the doctor there are some really heavy um gospel i don't even want to say undertones it's it's basically presenting the gospel wow um, interesting up to and including just the power of his name and how it, at the moment when he looks completely defeated um he he does nothing but love his enemies completely thwarts all of their plans all just because of the power of his name it's it's phenomenal it's i i was losing my mind watching watching wow. them. so for that reason alone david uh -huh. Tennant is my favorite doctor matt smith oh, okay. has a lot of fun quirks and mannerisms and stuff 
And Peter Capaldi has the absolute best dry Scottish sense of humor. But my favorite is David Tennant because of those really just three or four episodes where it's mm -hmm. the doctor versus the master. And it's, it's like Jesus versus Satan, basically. And then, and then hmm. at the end of it, you realize, wow, Satan truly had nothing. <laughs> he, he was going up against the creator and he thought that was a good idea. Okay. Right. You, you almost get that. Set, luck. But at one point, it looks like he completely wins, just like in the Gospels. So Interesting. that's me geeking out about Doctor Who. It's so much fun. <laughs> well, there's plenty of ways to geek out. You've got novelizations, you've got radio dramas, you've got TV shows, you've got live, both live action and animated TV shows. You've even got movies. Good grief. The compendium on that one alone is enough to just, <laughs> wow, it's mind boggling. And yes. there's, and it's still growing and not to mention the fan fiction. Wowzers. Yes. <clears throat> I I have a few friends. Well, on top of you, <laughs> you're, you're a primary geek, but I've got other geeks. <laughs> and I wear be, that title proudly. <laughs> I, I, I always like telling geeks, be the geek only you can be. I like saying that to people. Because <clears throat> when I was growing up, I was always made fun of because one of my favorite shows has been Star Trek. And I was always made fun of about it. And it's like, you know what? That's fine. You don't want to make fun of me. I'm the nerd. I'm the geek. Sure. Why not? I'll, I'll, I'll live with that one. But um, uh, there's only certain ways we, we get to be geeks because not everyone has to be the same geek. Be or else you wouldn't have those most entertaining moments, say, on Big Bang Theory when they start arguing about time travel or... My brothers, when they start arguing about time travel, <laughs> because my sure. brothers are the exact same way. I remember standing there one day and they started talking about time travel difference between Star Trek and Back to the Future. And they went off for an hour and to the point where at point, they were yelling at each other. <gasps> no, that is not. Oh, no. <laughs> I thought I was the geek. <laughs> Here's my brother being more geek and very about it. But anyway, very staunchly geek. Right. But even then, uh, I, I remember one time trying to go to a Star Trek convention in Minnesota. It was in 2001. <clears throat> and um, I remember walking in the door. And just some, I don't know what it was, but I'm just going, okay. And I walked right back out. So I get to be the Star Trek geek where I enjoy watching it on TV. I don't have to go live cosplay. Right. I don't have to go to the conventions, and that's fine for me. My brothers, on the other hand, have gone to the Star Trek conventions. They've stood there and visited with Armin Shimmerman and a few other actors. I've, I've visited with, uh, oh, what was his name? I can't remember his name. He, he wasn't a primary, but he, he did a lot of uh, guest appearances on nearly every single star trek show and so oh, wow. uh and i visited with him one time it's like okay great yeah just another guy he was talking when when i actually set, started talking to him he was already talking to somebody else about his flight into salt lake city it's like oh furry we can talk about airplanes so you don't always have to talk about you know something specific with the actor but anyways um if i'm going to go out on a limb here and i'm going to say that star trek is one of my favorites I might as well go all the way and say, okay, uh, no, 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 no. The worst Star Trek movie is number one. At least it used to be. Now, I have not seen the new one yet, but the new one is supposedly have had a complete revamp of sound, visual, and um, image. So apparently they've done a great deal of re-editing of the first movie that I still have yet to see. But even then, the, the, the original, ugh. Didn't care for it as much. But my favorite series was Deep Space Nine. Deep Space Nine. Yeah. It blended a couple of elements that I really enjoyed. You've got the Western theme. They're on the frontier. They're on the very edge of civilized space. Um, they're on an alien space station instead of just a generic uh, Federation space station, which even the, the generic Federal, it's just kind of, I don't know, bleak. 
it's very sterilized. Whereas with the Kardashian, you got a lot more personality and character involved in the architecture. Okay, now I'm really getting geeky there. I, I wasn't going to say that out loud, but yeah. But um, um, when it, there were several, definitely some themes in it, though, that I really enjoyed. And one of them was um, tolerance. Um, there, especially when in con context of religion, that was mm -hmm. very different having grown up with the original and also with TNG. So it's like, sure. oh, oh, this is definitely getting into an interesting realm. And there are people that I've, I've talked with who would argue that the Star Trek Deep Space Nine is, is kind of an offset when really I think it, it works very, very well. It offers a more um, natural expression of people within this world that had already been through TNG, especially T TNG, especially TNG of this more new age sort of um, enlightened approach to life. Because even as we know in Picard, Picard becomes disillusioned to the being to the Federation and being part of the Federation. So that's why I would say DS9 is a bit more realistic in, in its portrayal of living life, especially in that time of, time <laughs> that future setting and uh, alien setting I, I thought it worked very very well and i enjoyed it a lot and there was some my favorite episode is the begotten son oh it was so good now there was definitely some you could argue some scriptural themes that came out of the prodigal son because odo is reunited with the guy who discovered him who realized wow he's just not some sample that's an unknown sample sitting on a shelf which is what Odo means. It's Card uh, it was either Cardassian or Bajoran for unknown sample. So that's how he gets his name, is Odo. <laughs> but um, uh, Odo is approached by Quark saying, hey, guess what I have? I have a baby, no, a dead. I have a dead changeling. And Odo says, it's not dead, it's sick. And so Quark's trying mm -hmm. to sell it to him. It's like okay, that part's like yeah, okay, whatever. But really, the it, it really the, the entire theme, especially with the story of 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 Odo and his um, sort of um, adopted dad, has some really great relational interplays. Now, there's another side story uh, with with Kara giving birth to Miles O'Brien and Keiko's child because they transplanted. It's like, okay, but. <laughs> Anyways, um, really, when I when I focus on that theme, it's just a beautiful, beautiful scene, especially towards the end. I'm not going to ruin it for anybody, so go watch it, and it's it's a great episode. And then, not to mention, uh, uh, tribulation, trouble and tribulations, which is trouble with tribbles. So they did mm. a tie in to the original series, and it, that was just fun. That was so much fun. Nice. So that's definitely one of my favorites is Star Trek Deep Space Nine. How about you? What's Very cool. Um, so I'm glad that we did our, our last episode first because <laughs> my, my next, uh, my next one will be probably not, not probably it's definitely not uh Christian. We'll just say that. Oh yeah. Um, I, I really, really enjoyed the um Sherlock series with um Benedict Cumberbatch Cumberbatch yes yeah I really like again another British series but a really good series mm -hmm. how witty and sarcastic <laughs> they made him how um Watson brings about his humanity Hmm. how the two of them even connect and how Sherlock gets Watson through almost like reverse psychology and narcissism, his own narcissism. He challenges Watson to, uh, he, he's in the first episode. He uh, Watson is a war hero decorated mm -hmm. um, has something wrong with his leg or his knee and he uses a cane and he limps pretty significantly and by the end of the episode um he's off running behind sherlock and and the 
the camera pans back to the the booth at the diner where he left his cane because he was just so caught up in the moment and and it fulfilled what Sherlock had said that really your injury is just somatic but whatever you'll get you'll come to realize that, that eventually or that scene yeah. I at least saw that scene yeah it's a neat show and how they portray his brother and the crazed person that they make uh, Moriarty to be it's mm. it's fun mm. i am um, my my wife really enjoys sherlock holmes and i remember watching some of that one i didn't see all of them but the hounds of baskerville well, that one that one uh that one actually bothered me when i saw it because Good. at that time at that i couldn't even get through the first few minutes of the show because at that oh, time really? I, I was dealing with some stuff uh, uh first some oh. personal stuff that I, I had to process and it's like i can't do this now but my my wife and i we recently got the entire series and so it's like okay well we might i might sit down and try this again now that i'm in a better place than i was before i gotcha but i like i like i know what you mean because i i like sherlock holmes i like the analytical part of it and it, it really, mm -hmm. I, for me, it's it's one of those challenges of being not only self aware but observant. Mm -hmm. And I really and like some, that about that. Yeah, and there's a lot of a lot of shows that try and get like criminology or like the psychology of people or something, and it's mm -hmm. total BS. They do such an abysmal job of it, um, to the point like like the show Lie to Me, and and this expert on detecting lies and stuff it every almost every single method that he espouses in that show is mm -hmm. documented farcical oh okay. it's it's like if like well, you might have heard if if somebody looks up and to the left when they're when they're talking to you they're lying no they're not they're gathering their thoughts <laughs> it's it's uh anyway I, um, I, I've heard I've heard in, that if they look up to the up to the left, that's activating the imagination. If they're looking up to the right, then they're activating memories. That's the one I've heard. But even then, it's totally like false. okay. Go ahead. Totally what were you going to say? False. I interrupted. Sorry. But in Sherlock, they do some really neat things with true psychology. So mm -hmm. uh, there's this one scene. It it won't spoil anything for anyone if you haven't seen it. But they go to um, a car crash. And um, and Sherlock, played by Benedict Cumberbatch, um, walks up to. I think it was the sister of the guy who had been driving the car and is now deceased. I don't think it was his wife, but anyway, he walks up to her, and he plays like he's all all somber, and um, and they know the the gentleman's name. I don't remember what it was. Um, and he says, "I I'm so sad that he's gone, and we were such good friends, and the sisters." in the middle of her very genuine grief, trying to figure out who this person is. Like, how did you know him? I'm like, oh, we were at school together. And she goes, oh, okay, so you're a doctor too? He goes, yes, yes, I'm a doctor too. And but he hadn't known that he, the guy was a doctor. So he's doing this as a, a form of interrogation. Um, and, and he's just drawing out of this woman. Of course, it's all just cinematic, but he's drawing right. out of this woman de life details about the deceased guy that he would not have had before. And then she catches him at it eventually. And, um, and he makes a, a statement about the guy that is completely false. And he's just making it up on the spot. Mm. And she says, no. That's not true at all. He blah 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 blah. Uh -huh. And as they're yeah, walking yeah. away, being borderline thrown <laughs> off the the crime scene, Watson's like, "Why are you distressing that poor woman in her grief?" And and Sherlock very very smartly and accurately says, "People love to correct you if you're wrong." So rather than mm. just ask her the question. If she gets all all uh, all uh, passionate or, or frustrated and puts you in your place, you know you're getting the truth then, mm -hmm. because people like to be right. Mm -hmm. It's like oh snap! And so it's just fun in that way as a counselor. It's fun to watch a show where they actually get the psychology right and some stuff <laughs> like that. 
<laughs> I think it's interesting when a personal's someone's personal interest or even career influences what they watch. Um, when I was doing, when I was counseling a lot of people, one of my favorite shows was Frasier. Because here's all, the, here's this, especially it was men. I was sitting down with men and we were talking a lot about relationships with dads and with siblings. And here's Frazier having a relationship with his dad and also one with the Niles. And it's just, it was brilliantly written for one. I, I honestly thought that a lot of the writers, <clears throat> they, they managed to maintain a certain level of high expectation when it came to the dialogue. It was smart. It was witty. It was honest. It was also highfalutin, mm -hmm. <laughs> very pompous, especially for Frazier. But they were able to interweave all of these comedic things in that was just brilliantly done. The only one that I felt was just a little, uh, I, I wouldn't say completely odd, but it, it was it definitely kind of lost tone with everything else, was when Niles um, goes through the non-dialogue scene of him ironing his pants. Because you know hmm. all of this is just complete physical comedy. Which... David was a phenomenal comedian. Yes. And when it comes to his physical physical comedy, he is there. I mean, this guy can nail it. But you knew it was over the top, especially with the entire show, because there's no consequences. He does mm -hmm. he, Niles, Niles does it. Frazier does it. They do these stupid things, and they never deal with a consequence for those stupid things. And so mm -hmm. um it definitely allows a little bit more alleviation from the reality of, of life without completely removing all aspects of life. And that's what I really appreciated about Frazier. And I, okay. Me in England. Now you, 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 you've listed already a couple of uh, English shows that you really enjoy. And, and I have to say that I, I grew up more, let's see. I grew up more on Andy Griffith's show and Petticoat Junction, Green Acres, and stuff like that than I did anything else. But when I got older, I definitely shifted over to English shows. Mr. Bean, Black Adder, um, Oh, Good Grief, Good Neighbors, um, uh, Midsummer Murder. And so my next show I would actually bring up would be Midsummer Murder because not only does career and interest reflect what you watch, but so does your um, the type of life you want to live. Midsummer Murder is very low key. It's got. Are you very saying you wanted to be a murderer? Is that <laughs> the kind of life you wanted to live? Okay, I, I'll definitely is this a confessional? say. Confessional. <laughs> no, I don't. But I think it's I think it's funny that um, a murder show would be one of my favorites, only because how um, the pacing of it is a lot slower and it's much more relaxed and it's it's not hurried, it's not fast paced, it's not in your face sort of experience. I get so exhausted with those kind of experiences. I the, I call it the Marvel effect. I'm done with the Marvel effect. Can we please just get back to some basic writing, some basic storytelling? And that's what I like when it comes to Midsummer Murder, especially because of the pacing. Because when you get into these little English villages, you can feel the environment of the place and how relaxed everybody is. And how and how you've got this, this nominal state of being that's just, just quite nominal and steady. And... Yeah. I didn't For grow me, up with any of those shows. <laughs> well, I didn't get into Midsummer Murder until nine. Uh, let's see, 20, 2018, 2019, right around in there. Um, my grandmother and I were watching something on PBS. She fell asleep, and I didn't get up to change the channel. And then Midsummer Murder comes on, and I watch an episode. Go, oh, this is actually pretty good. So that's how I nice. found out about, about Midsummer Murder. But no, when I was a kid, uh, PBS was one of the few channels that came in clear on our television set in Parowan. And so um, I would watch Mr. Bean as often as I could. Another favorite. You know how old that makes you sound, right? Oh, I know. 
I, I love you, and I know you're not that old. I know you're not that old. It's I'm just the way you grew up. I didn't get up to change the channel. And and this was in, like, 2018. I know what you probably meant was I didn't get up to go find the remote, but but it just invoked a picture of walking over to the tube and turning the dial. And then when you said <laughs> Mr. Bean was the only, or PBS was the only thing that came in clear on our TV, like, I, I know that you're not that old. Come on, Josiah. But this is really, you sound like you could be my grandfather right now. <laughs> really not. Although, back in my day, Sonny, TV had some morals. Uh, I have been mistaken for being older by so many people. Watching the radio, wishing there was a screen on it. <laughs> well, in some ways, I feel like that. Yes, my upbringing was definitely dated. Uh, a lot of the stuff I was able to do growing up was definitely much more dated than than contemporary life was at the time. I didn't listen to Michael Jackson until. Um, my late teens. Okay. Van Halen, all of that. I didn't listen to any of that until my twenties. So mm -hmm. it was it was when I when I I finally left home and I'm sitting it in in, uh, in my room with my roommates and I realized they're talking about all of these movies from the eighties. I never saw any of them. So I went to the library and I grabbed twenty something movies from the eighties and I sat or from my childhood that I heard about and I sat down and I watched them all, including Ghostbusters and. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Karate Kid, and um, oh, good grief! Uh, uh, the the story about the boys, the, the kids that go off and find the, the hidden pirate ship. Um, uh, you know, I you're not remember. talking about um, the Disney edition of um, Tom and Huck, are you? No, not Tom and Huck. Pirate ship. But it's just a group of kids. I know. I know the name of this. When it comes to me. I'm gonna. Yeah, that's that'll be it. But anyways, um, so yeah, I can definitely understand how that would sound that way. I've had many people look at me and say, "What are you in your fifties? No, I'm in my early forties. Give me a break." <laughs> Come on. But it also makes sense, given not but, just the way you talk about getting up to change the channel, but also like you have more knowledge and wisdom than any single person should should have in any lifetime it's like like you've got to be at least part vampire to have lived as many lifetimes as no, and and be as knowledgeable as you are so i i could see why people mistake your your age okay well i, I don't know and if that wasn't the most backhanded compliment <laughs> thank you <laughs> But no, I mean, Mr. Bean was was fantastic. Here's a guy who's not saying a whole lot. It kind of reminded me of Buster Keaton or Charlie Chaplin, those old silent films. Now I'm really dating myself because I used to watch some of those too. Um, there was even a theater in Salt Lake City and uh, it was silent movies. And there was this guy that would sit off to the side and he'd play organ music to it. And me and my brothers would go there and watch the movies. It was a blast. And so, yes, man, our, our interests are a bit more dated than most people these days. I grew up um, with my grandmother listening uh, to a big band uh, era music and um, watching black and whites almost all the time. We very rarely ever watched in color television. So, yeah, <laughs> I fought for that. I'll definitely, I'll definitely hand that to you. But Mr. Bean was another favorite that just was just so laugh out loud funny. And it translated, it, it didn't need language. It just, all, everything just translated so well. And Rowan Atkinson, what has he got? An IQ of what was what it? 160, 180? The guy is incredibly yeah. smart. And he's pulling off this character that just, it's just funny. And um, I, I really enjoy British TV. I actually do. British humor aside, because I never got into Monty Python. I remember the first time I ever saw Monty Python and the Holy Grail. I was, at, at, uh, let's see, I was in my late teens. I didn't get it. But I thought it was so funny, especially when I found out later that the reason that they didn't, that they had those coconut shells and they're clickety, 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 clickety
because the horses fell through for the production. And so they thought, well, let's find a, an engine. Let's just find a way to, to incorporate that in. So they went to the grocery store, bought some coconuts, cracked them in half, yep. and just used those. <laughs> and then out of that come all of the dialogue about a, a laden or an unladen swallow carrying a coconut. And where would it find a coconut? And, and, and Yeah, all of that came out of that incident. It really did. It's great. You're right. They, those were the most painful movies to watch, but they are so extremely quotable. Oh, very. Oh, very. Well, do you have one more show? Um, I was thinking I might do a throwback and and share one that a little bit more from childhood. Like I grew up. So okay, I'll tell I'll tell you what I grew up on. We'll just <laughs> this. This comparison on, will demonstrate man. to all of our listeners why you're the smart one on the podcast. I so you that. grew up with Andy Griffith. I grew up with CSI, um, mostly okay. CSI Las Vegas, CSI Miami, NCIS, Criminal Minds. Those were the fictional things that we watched. And then we would also watch things like um, um, Survivor, uh, The Great... No, the the amazing oh, race fear factor okay. those sorts of things so, reality tv at its finest <laughs> reality tv that didn't have to do with singing we we were never oh. big american idol people or anything like yeah. that yeah 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 okay singing or talent yeah yeah Did you, you didn't oh watch and iron that? chef we watched a lot of iron chef okay. when i was a kid uh, that doesn't have a lot of yelling in it um by Yes, only because it's it's a large stadium that they're in. But uh, oh, okay. the main host is is Japanese and and so when he starts the episode or when when he introduces the the chefs and then he tells them, "Okay, go." He he shouts that. Hello, or, or whatever he says. I have no idea what he's saying, but <laughs> but yeah, he shouts it and he drops his arm all dramatically and then they run for the the platters of whatever the the ingredient of the day is but mm. but the last show that i'll actually talk about with any length i really enjoyed <laughs> and and this might be some people's last episode with us um i la last episode we talked about the office a little bit but i really enjoyed um avatar the last airbender oh you did not you did not I just did. say that uh -oh. Wait a minute. Which one? Though? Are we still friends? No. Well, no. Let, let's let's clarify though. Let's clarify though. There's the movie. the movie. That's M Night Shyamalan, and that was okay. a big blockbuster. It was a yes. dud. In more Never ways even than saw one. it. But you're talking about the show. Yes. The cartoon show, right? Yeah. Okay. Wasn't it the four seasons where they they go through? They start in the Water Tribe, and then they go to earth mm -hmm. land fire so i think it was just four seasons but yeah that's that's the one i'm referring to not okay the movie. okay are we okay. still friends oh very much okay good what you choose to watch or listen to is not going to change that but you were aside yeah i'll still like you <laughs> okay good Whew. that was close <laughs> and if you'd like to apply to be the host of Bearded Bible Brothers, since Matt just got fired, please email beardedbiblebrothers at gmail.com. Josiah will be taking interviews via Zoom. <laughs> you know what? That's that's it's funny because it makes me think of um, how Jeff Dunham does a plug for his website. We could do a plug, find a way to do a plug for our email. Jeff Dunham. <laughs> really, it's Jeff penis. just did a plug for, for him. him. There you go, Jeff Dunham. Right? <laughs> Get a plug for you, but no, I, I I didn't I didn't actually I don't remember watching a lot of it, but I actually saw some episodes of the Airbender and um, anime uh, style a uh, animation was very different from what I grew up with. Yes, because I also grew up with uh, uh, Saturday morning cartoons or really even early morning yeah. cartoons. Sometimes where it's during the summertime, you've got Dennis the Menace, you've got uh, uh, the Rangers, uh, you've got uh, Darkwing Duck, Gargoyles, and so those that was the style 
that I'd gotten used to. And so watching right. anime, I'm going, oh, this is very right angled. Oh, okay. Kind of trying to <laughs> figure it out a little bit. Now, but, that's, that's the only anime that I ever got into. I know that there are tons and tons of others, and, and there are lots of people that get into some of those more anime ones. Like, uh, I, I had friends in, in college that said it's not true anime unless it's in Japanese. If it's in mm -hmm. English, it's not true anime and stuff. So mm -hmm. Airbender was the only one that I really watched. And I just I, I know what you mean about it being uh, differently depicted, like a different type of art drawing of the yeah. characters. Yeah. But besides that, it had a lot of American-esque humor um, in a different I locale. vaguely remember that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, okay, well, that's not too dating for you, I don't think. Although, yes, that was definitely what late, what was that, 80s? I think that was 80s. 70s or 80s. Was it? Yeah. I didn't I discover it until college, so. Uh, maybe 90s. Somewhere in there. <laughs> I would say probably 90s or early 2000s, but I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Night Court. Night Court. Have you ever heard of that? Night Court? Is that the reality show with like Judge Judy or, or that type of show? No. Okay, no. then tell me about Night okay. Court. So when I was younger, um, I remember being over to a friend's house. Uh, this would have been 1988, maybe 89 over at a friend's house and their dad's watching night court on television. And it is the show where Harry stone is a night court judge in New York city. And throughout the night, these just random oddball people come through and he's having to pass judgment and connect with them and relate with them um, throughout the night. And you've got antics going on from John Larroquette of all people. I mean, his comedy aside, his stand up stuff aside, what he did in that show was hysterical. Even Brent Spiner, the guy that played Data in Star Trek, yeah, he did a guest spot for he did a he did a recurring character on occasion of this uh, country bumpkin who <laughs> blew. One of the one of the stories was is that they tried doing a, a worm farm and they had a stampede. <laughs> they lost all their worms. It's like oh when his, his wife's talking about how it's a nightmare of watching all the spaghetti you ever ate come back to haunt you. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> it's so <laughs> funny. Now, I, I should clarify. So I'm not confusing the new one with the old one. Melissa Rauch, who played uh, Bernadette on Big Bang Theory, is mm -hmm. uh, now doing a new night court with John Larroquette. He's the only one that's come back for a, a primary role. But uh, the original show, it was it had a lot of humor. And I mean, I, I like to laugh. I really like to laugh. I really do. And so if I can laugh, I'm having a good time. And so when I'm able to sit down and watch some Night Court and just laugh, but also, also at the same time have some very real, honest moments. One of the, in the first episode, in the first season, um, there is Carla and she's a prostitute and she comes before the judge and she starts misconstruing his kindness for him wanting her. And mm. so she's learning what it's like to be able to receive dignity. It's one of my Gosh, favorite man. episodes. It's like, yes, because during the episode, she starts, she ends up eh, going into a pseudocidal moment really when she wasn't, but uh, this other judge comes in and he's already telling Harry, you're a bit unorthodox. You don't really, you need to work with more with the club and, and, and be in line with everyone else. And um, Harry finally calls him out, which was just perfect. As a matter of fact, he actually does one of those shows that you mentioned earlier, those judge duty things. He went on, I think to actually have one of his own, I think. Um, oh, wow. But um, uh, it was just, it was just so amazing watching people be real and honest with other people. And it's like I talked about in our, in, in that other podcast we did, um, you have one of those moments that just kind of blow your perspective. Mm -hmm. Being kind to your neighbor, loving your neighbor, 
You want that? Oh, you'll get it in spades in night court. Here's Harry Stone. He's not a professing Christian, but the way he is, or a professing believer in Jesus, the way he's treating people is with dignity. There's consistency. There's reliability. There is, I see you. I get you. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And there's even, there's even one episode where there's a, there's a, um, a basketball goal in, in the courtroom, and it's actually in the form of a cross. And so he starts having an interaction, a conversation with the cross as if he's talking to God. And it's just a very honest conversation. And one of, that's one of the things I appreciated about the show is that it challenged me to have more of an honest, open conversation, a prayer with time with God than this um, pseudo prayer. You, you know what I mean? It's this, this idea yeah. of going, I'm trying to sound right. I'm trying to say right things when I'm not really getting to anything core going on in my heart that I'm actually thinking about. It was very superficial yeah. prayer. And so that's one of the things I appreciated about the show. It's that it's raw, it's honest, and it's it's got some very real moments where you're confronted with what would you do in this moment? How would you interact with this type of person? Because here's Harry, nice enough young guy, um, uh, reasonably good looking, and here's this, what would be considered the trash of society being traipsed before him night after night, him going, hey, person, how you doing? Going, yeah, that's I like cool. that. I like that. So that's another one. That that's, that, that, that's my, there's some others I would be happy to talk about, but that's really the one I really want to capstone mine on is, is the okay. night part. So. I just, you just reminded me of another one that I wanted to riff on, but we can, we can wrap up our episode. No, go we'll ahead. No, you, 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 you give me your last one. Do it. Okay. My last, <laughs> last one <laughs> would be person of interest. Ah, um, Jim Caviezel. Really good show. Jim Caviezel. Um, before he took the role of, of Jesus or Yeshua in, passion mm. he was warned if you do this this will be the end of your Ruin career your career yep. and for, for quite a long time he didn't get any other roles until person of interest it was his re-entry as far as i'm aware it was his re-entry into acting oh. and it was phenomenal mm. so basic premise uh, of the show is um there is a really really brilliant nerdy guy who creates the system for the u.s government after 9 11 creates the system that spies on everyone uses mm. every single traffic camera every single camera at an atm every cell phone every everything mm -hmm. to keep tabs on homeland security um and they were going they had him build the system such that um, it would it could detect all crime almost like Minority Report, um, oh, but they yeah, were okay, yeah. focused on the ones that were terrorism, mm -hmm. and so they they wanted him to just throw away the rest of the data, right? And so just before he quit working for the government, he built a back door into the system, mm -hmm. left, and then recruits, for lack of a better term, Jim Caviezel's character, who's like this super. Uh, he's a, a washed up, um, uh, not washed up like disgraced, but um, but but he's a, a honored, decorated war veteran who's got major uh, PTSD. And at the beginning of the show, he was about to kill himself until um, the nerdy guy shows up and gives him a job and gives him a purpose and stuff. So the machine, because he had to hide the back door into the system. They mm -hmm. don't get any data on what's going to happen except a social security number. So mm. they don't know if that person is going to be the perpetrator or a victim or oh, what. Oh, interesting. But the machine spits out a number and then Jim Caviezel's character tails them and follows them and tries to figure out what's going to happen and possibly prevent mm -hmm. a crime, possibly save a life. And the nerdy guy is is hmm. in his office providing as much data as he can through whatever searches he can find. It's a great show. Hmm. It's it's a lot of fun. It starts like a typical crime show, like CSI or NCIS. Yeah, it's been the first episode. Yeah, 
But as the seasons progress, it becomes a lot more, um, there's a lot more investment into the characters mm -hmm. and, um, and it's not just one episode to the next of a different crime being solved. Right. Right. So, right. You get more depth of character. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I never, I never really saw the, the show, but I've seen a few scenes and a few episodes. So I didn't know all of that background. So that that's actually really good to know, but uh, it always cool. thought, I remember when I was watching it, um, the, there's a certain serenity to Jim Caviezel in the, in the show going, okay, there's something definitely happened to him on the passion. Something definitely happened to him on the passion because between that and um, what was that, that uh, the, the uh, um, golf show, golf movie he did. He was still calm and calm in the golf movie, but um, person of interest, you can really see a transition in his yeah. acting patterns um it reminds me of jimmy stewart because before world war mm. ii he was much more uh you had that mr deeds goes to washington sort of guy who was a little bit more jittery especially around women a little more hesitant and everything but after world war ii you see this aggression you see this confidence about him that's when he did more of the uh the westerns that he did in his mm. career and so uh, it, 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 you can definitely see that transition in his acting style. And so I definitely saw that with Jim Caviezel, but I might have to go back and check that out. Now that, now that you explained it a little bit more, it might be something we're it checking out. Show. But yeah, we could keep going on this all day long, but really it's been a blast. Yes, we could so far. And hopefully our, for our listeners, this has been one of those episodes where you're able to just kick back and just relax and laugh and, and just kind of zone out if you will. And so uh, we look forward to you checking back in with us again next time. Again, if you have any thoughts, uh, questions, or even uh, an idea for an episode, please feel free to write us at uh, beardedbiblebrothers at gmail.com. We'd really like to hear from you. And uh, Until then, though, uh, look forward to having you back again. And remember, be the geek only you can be.